Um, <clears throat> I'm curious about one thing. Your, your daughter and son uh, were, was born, were born uh, um, before or, or after your film like uh, Parasite Murder and uh, Rabbit and The Brood <laughs> overall? Yeah, my uh, oldest daughter is 16, so she was born before I started to make this, these films. And at the end, uh, end 70s, early 80s, there were some uh, uh, movies uh, very concerned with the idea of uh, giving birth uh, uh, with generation. Uh, I, I think uh, Alien uh, by Scott uh, and uh, overall um, the film by Lynch. Uh, uh, a razor hand, uh, of course, elephant man, and uh, well, I'm. I wonder if if there was some something like a, a, a mood, and if you if you think or if you thought uh, there was something similar in this uh, preoccupation about this idea of of the obscurity of a generation, the, 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 the body, who, body who, who, who give birth to other bodies or who have other bodies inside them. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, there was a festival in Germany at Hof, a small town, and uh, they showed uh, a lot of my films there. And when they showed Shivers, which is one of my first films, a uh, man stood up very angry in the audience and he said, how dare you show this, you know, it's so obvious you've stolen all of this from Alien. And I said, but this film was made five years before Alien. He said, aha, now we know who the thief is. Um, I, I don't, I think it's odd sometimes there does seem to be uh, some mysterious synchronicity, you know, amongst films. Um, Dead, when Dead Ringers finally got made, suddenly there were many films about twins, for some reason, five or six. Uh, and in the ten years before that, when I was trying to make the movie, there were none. I don't know why this happened. Uh, sometimes, of course, a film will influence other films, and then it's really a cinematic question rather than a social question. But uh, it's, it does happen. I don't quite know what it means, though. You, you you like, um, for, for instance, uh, the, the films of uh, Lynch, you know? Yes, you, I like. I, I, I love The Racerhead. I still think it's his best movie, actually. Uh, Elephant Man, to me, was very a uh, Victorian Valentine, you know? Very uh, conventional. Didn't really... It was okay. <laughs> but I didn't think it was his, his, you know, I didn't think it was really David Lynch. It was produced by Mel Brooks, right. who produced it to right. your fly. He's fascinated by this strange... Uh... No, he only likes to produce the films of men named David. Uh, actually, no, Mel is uh, a very interesting uh, man, of course. As a producer, he's very interested to do films that he cannot do as a director. When, you know, he... he uh, when he came to me to do The Fly, he, he said, you know, I don't understand the genre, but something, there's something about this story I really think could be fantastic. So I want you to do it because I couldn't, I don't know how. And, uh, uh, and that's very interesting for a, for a man who is, of course, an actor, a writer, a director himself, to be able to do that. Um, you told... Uh, I was uh, very interested in this sort of movies then. Now I wanted. No, it's uh, ten years. I want to. I wanted to do this uh, movie about twins. But I think in your movies, this uh, this question, but also in this uh, movie, actually, is is very connected. These <laughs> things because at the beginning there are. Immediately sex, uh, immediately the the body, the composition of, yeah. of body, and so it's a uh, perfectly introduced, if uh, if one uh, would say in your 
work, you know. Uh, um, about these um, twins, these uh, dead, uh, dead ringers, um, there is a, uh, something like a recall with the, uh, two scanners. There were something like two brothers, two, two, two men who had exactly similar power. You, you, you thought to, to this question? No, no, I've never made that connection. Mm -hmm. But I think it's legitimate to do that. I mean, I think there are connections. But uh, for, it must be unconscious ones, because I, I hadn't really thought of that before. But I am always interested in... Um, of course, when you talk about brothers or sisters, you're talking about people who are related. And what do we mean by related? We mean somehow by blood, by genetics, by the body. And it's interesting to see how that relates to the development of the mind as well. Are they also connected or are they not? You know, how, how much... You know, so I think that, yes, I think it's legitimate to say that there is a connection between those two. Uh, you, you worked in the same time, I, I think, on these two projects, uh, The Ringer Twins and uh, Total Recall. I think so. Total Recall is, uh, mm, is from a novel by, by Dick. It's actually from a short story. From a short story by yeah. Dick. You, you are fascinated in generally by, by Dick or is mm, casual? Is no, it's, very, it's casual. I mean, uh, he was an interesting man. Uh, I think very strange man. Um, maybe very self-destructive. I'm not sure. I've read some things about him, and he's very fascinating. But uh, I have a problem with a lot of science fiction in terms of the quality of the writing. You know, not most, uh, most of the science fiction writers I read when I was very young, I cannot read now. Because the writing, the ideas are interesting, but the writing itself is not very good. And I have great trouble with that. And Dick is very uneven. Some this short story, it's not really a good short story, but there's a wonderful idea there. And this is why that movie has had so much trouble getting born also, because there's a wonderful concept for the beginning, but there's no ending, and it's very difficult to find the ending. So that, uh, that's why Total Recall has, is a project that no one has yet made. Uh, there have been six or seven directors who've tried me and Fred Skepsi, uh, Richard Rush, Bruce Beresford, and now I hear that Paul Verhoeven is going to make it or try to make it. We'll see what happens. And there is three uh, short, I think, The Victim, The Lie Chair, mm -hmm. and The Italian Machine. Yes. And um, I wanted to know something about uh, this. Well, I don't know how illuminating it'll be with it, without having seen them, but... Uh, I hope. <laughs> the two, uh, the victim and the lie chair, were the first television uh, shows that I did. They were on videotape, and I did them quite a long time ago. Uh, and it was very interesting because they were written, they were not written by me. And I really did them uh, because I was interested to see what it was like to use videotape. Then it was two-inch videotape, and to use uh, to shoot in the in the video style, which was uh, not to edit, but to use many cameras, and to rehearse the whole uh, show from beginning to end like a play, and then have the cameras cutting while you shoot, switching from camera to camera. Is a you 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 are directing in direct. In the yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. And um, I know that uh, Coppola sort of tried to do that with film and video for One from the Heart, but I don't know why, <laughs> because it's, it's, um, it's not very precise. And you are very distanced from your actors because you are up in the uh, machine talking over a microphone and it, it was, it's somewhat frustrating because you can't be close to what's going on and you don't have the pre precision, you don't have the chance to do things many times and then to edit. Um, it was interesting. 
it was almost like doing live television or something in the in the fifties. But uh, it would it's not my favorite way to to make a film. Uh, an interesting experiment. The, the genre. What was the genre? Uh, it's sort of psychological drama. Really. Ah, because I'm absolutely different. It's uh, short. The victim and lecture probably for a peep show. <laughs> it's incredible in this. Yes. Well, it was called, but the the. The TV series was called <laughs> Peep Show. <laughs> so there is a mistake. Oh, yeah, Probably a for a Peep Show, oh, yes. No, that's, that's a big mistake, yeah. <laughs> and Italian Machine also it was a TV. Yes, but that was shot in film, 16 millimeter, a mo like a film. And it was about uh, uh, a motorcycle, an Italian motorcycle, Ducati. Um, about some uh, motorcycle enthusiasts who tried to steal a motorcycle that is owned by a man who, who bought it just because he thought it was beautiful and put it in his living room as a sculpture. And the motorcycle uh, enthusiasts think that that's bad. It should be out liberated onto the streets. You know. But it's a small uh, thing. And, but I, I love motorcycles and, and uh, racing cars and so on. So this was my, you know. Film it's that. yours. I did write this, yeah. This one. You prefer um, human, machine, or uh, motorcycles, uh, cars? Uh? Well, they're different. But it's interesting to think, I mean, it, when, when we make a machine, we, we are, in a way, it's our version of the human body, you know? I mean, in a sense, the human body is a machine, as, as William Burroughs has called it, the soft machine. And uh, it is, it's interesting, when you open up a machine, you, you see the mind of the man who designed it. You know, and the, I enjoy, I do that. I, I enjoy working on uh, the motors of cars and motorcycles and so on. I think it's, uh, you have the whole history of uh, man there, the technology, the design, the rationality. You can have designs that are brilliant and inspired, and you ha can have some that are very ordinary and not very interesting. So it's it's a philosophical adventure, really, to to uh, work on a on a machine. I think. Um, when when you worked about Total Recall, uh, Philip Dick was already dead. No, I think he was still alive. Actually, I think he died shortly after that. I you think. didn't work with it. No, no. With him. No. I think the uh, the original uh, screenplay was written by Ron Chusset, who was one of the producers of Alien, in fact, and uh, and that's what I was presented with. And now um, you are working about another of your, I think, old and fascinating project, Naked Lunch. Mm -hmm. And you are working with the Burroughs, or...? Well, we've been talking about it for maybe five years. I think I met Burroughs five or six years ago, and uh, with Jeremy Thomas, who produced The Last Emperor and uh, a lot of other films. And uh, there's some... I want to do something that has to do with Burroughs and with that book. <coughs> but it's, it's really very difficult. It's really an impossible book to put on the screen. You, so I have to transform it somehow so that it can be on the screen, and I'm not sure yet how to do that. But you are, you are going to do now, or, or not? Is it your next movie? Well, only if I can figure out how to do it. I mean, this is always the dangerous thing. I could spend uh, a year writing a screenplay, and then at the end say, this is no good. It's possible. Then you have to start with something else from the beginning. You are generally fascinated by Burroughs, or is uh, only this one novel? Oh no, it, with Burroughs, it's everything. I mean, his life as well. Um, a, a very unusual man, and really one of the founders of the Beat Generation with Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg. And because of that, one of the foundations of what happened in the 60s, you know, the whole hippie movement and everything, in a, it, Burroughs was really at one of the founders of all of that in a strange way. And I find all of that very fascinating. Uh, but 
uh, I don't yet know how to put that on paper and then on screen. I haven't figured that out yet. I think it's so fascinating also for the for the 80s uh, <laughs> Barrows with oh, yes. all, all his uh, novels and short stories and short stories about uh, this uh, pre-recorded uh, this uh, cat uh, this uh, um, mixed visions uh, I think is, is now television uh, the, the, the work of the television now is absolutely narrated already narrated in this uh, I'm very fascinated by that. Yeah, and, but to do that on film, that's something, I don't want to, well, it's a whole, but he's, I think he's a very important writer, and uh, I'd like to do something that conveys some of that to, through cinema, but I don't yet know how. I, I saw um, Videodrome um, many times, and I think is something between, let's say, uh, between Dick uh, and Barrows. Mm. Yes, well, I think that's fair. I think that's All very right. fair to say, yeah. Mm, what do you think of real, real life, uh, real life uh, television, who is now, I, I mean, uh, mm, crime watching uh, mm. uh, shows uh, in the States? I don't know if it's also in Canada. Yeah. It's very strange, isn't it? Uh, it's, uh, an, it, but it's really what I, I think it's just even more of what I was talking about in Videodrome that. Uh, reality is being replaced by another reality that's a video media television reality which for some people is more real than anything else and it, it, it is real it, 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 people make political decisions based on media reality um, what's happening in in places like let's say Beirut Lebanon uh, the media reality is quite different from what the people experience who live there. And yet, for most of the people in the world, what they see on television, what they hear on the radio, what they read in the paper, that is reality. There's, there is no other one. It suddenly becomes two separate realities uh, distanced from each other. It's quite strange. Don't you think that perhaps, uh, no, that you can think, that perhaps uh, the reality is already repla replaced by another reality. I, I don't know, I, I, I'm very fascinated in, in Dead Ringers by the fact that the film is quite um, natural, quite uh, no monsters, you know, some instruments, some little, but <laughs> um, you are um, continu continuously uh, thinking that perhaps all these uh, are, I don't know, um, robots. Uh, it's something in, 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 other, in, in your other movies, that these bodies are going to explode, mm -hmm. perhaps. Uh, now, actually, they don't explode, but yeah, um, that something is uh, forever uh, mutate, that the mutation is already gone. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm talking to David Cronenberg, and I don't know if he's a machine, if he's, uh, who he's yes, actually. Yes. Well, it, from my side, I think there is another David Cronenberg walking around that many people think is the real one, and maybe he is. <laughs> because people read, they think they know me. You know, of course, um, this happens to anybody in the, in the media. But it's the first time it's happened to me. It's very interesting. People think they know me, they know about my life, uh, and they don't. But they, they know about this other one, you know, the media one, the one in the magazines and on television and so on. Um, I, th I believe, though, that we are, you know, we think that our physical existence is stable, relatively stable, but I think it isn't. I think the body is like a, a hurricane. Uh, it's constantly changing and uh, shifting, and it's only illus an illusion that it's the same day after day after day. Really, it's never the same from one moment to the next. So that's why the, the question of identity becomes even more compelling. We, s we feel that we are someone who continues, who has a history, 
will have a future. But you can't prove that. It's impossible to prove that. And yet we feel it to be true, that it is reality. So I'm very interested in that. And that's one of the themes, of course, of, of Dead Ringers in particular. Two bodies. Is it two bodies? Is it two identities? I'm not sure. Videodrome uh, was uh, influenced by your work on, on TV, for TV. Not really. And you, in, in this movie, you seem very fascinated by the idea of snuff movies, of... of uh, well, I think uh, that's another false, well, not false, alternate reality. Because I don't think there ever was a snuff movie. Uh, uh, many people have uh, tried to prove it, that there was or is, or, and, and there, no one has ever seen it. I think it's a myth. Uh, but the idea is so fascinating that it might as well be real. You know, it doesn't matter if there ever was a real South American, Colombian snuff movie. But I have uh, my uh, James Woods uh, character say, you know, why, why go to the trouble of actually killing somebody? You can fake it. It's, ch you know, it's cheaper, it's more convincing, and it's less dangerous. Um, but what interested me more was how, f how f the public wanted, I think the public w wanted it to be real. You know, while saying how horrible it was, how terrible, uh, I think they really wanted it to be real. That was, I found that very interesting. Why did they want it so badly to be real? Uh, you often find this, you know, that uh, the, 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 the strangest and the most horrible things, uh, the most bizarre, the most sexually perverse things, uh, people by spending a lot of energy and saying how bad it is and talking about the implications of it, they they keep it alive. They they want they want it to be there. It's it's an interesting thing that I notice, and uh, I think in this in the case of snuff movies, I think uh, I think that was a very spectacular case of that. At, at the end, we saw some uh, snuff movies. Uh, I don't know the the. The Challenger who exploded the <laughs> TV direct, also uh, Reagan being yes. being near ex yes. assassinated. Yeah, I mean, that's a very really a wonderful observation because it's true that it's on the news that you see the real snuff movie, snuff TV is very popular. Uh, I've seen people commit suicide on TV. I've seen people jumping to their death on TV, and yet no one. No one ever calls it that, you know. They think it must be some strange South American uh, movie with prostitutes being strangled and so on. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it feels that it's very perverse, and I'm not. But I'm not sure that it is. I'm not sure that it is. Is it? Does it distance us from from? Uh, a, a reality, or is it another kind of, or is it involving us? You know, when people see the Challenger explode and, and cry in their homes, is that, is that bad, or is that a kind of communion that you can only have through some medium like television? I don't know. I really don't know. But it's very powerful, though. And, it's, and it is changing everything. In... Uh... In Dead Ringers, there is one uh, scene uh, who's very uh, hard to me, uh, uh, hardcore scene. Uh, just one, when, when there is Genevieve Bujold who uh, uh, kisses or perhaps uh, bi bites, bites uh, in the dream, in dream, I think, uh, the, the strange, you, uh, strange organ uh, that yeah. uh, join. And, um, well, actually, it's, it's a real uh, hard hardcore movie sequence, <laughs> I think. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I think you are um, quite fascinated by, the, the, by pornography and also hardcore movies. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking uh, to your previous movies, thinking to Marilyn Chambers in, uh, in uh, Rabbit. Yeah. Uh, 
and I think you 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 know you you knew of course she was yes. Uh, yes. a hard yeah. Um Yeah. Well, I, I'm, of course, I think most artists are always drawn to those things that are covered and hidden, and therefore they are, in one way or another, drawn to what is forbidden, what is taboo. They don't. You can't. If you're an, a serious artist, you cannot accept taboo, something that you must not look at, you must not think about, you must not touch. You say, no, no, I must. The more you say no, the more I say yes. And uh, of course, uh, sexuality is uh, in many forms and uh, different varieties is uh, one of the most taboo subjects in uh, um, gynecology. I mean, uh, I had one of the reasons I had so much trouble financing Dead Ringers was not just because it was an art movie or a difficult movie or a bizarre movie or a tragic movie, but because it was gynecology. And when you think of it, despite the fact that every woman you know goes to a gynecologist and every man knows some woman who goes to a gynecologist, you, you don't ever see it in film. I, I, don't, I can't remember seeing a character in a film who's a gynecologist or, or scenes in a gynecological office it's very rare. Why is why you know so um, so uh, of course I'm then and, and pornography is even in cultures which allow it, like America, uh, uh, it's still very taboo, very forbidden. It has and, and that immediately draws me to it. I mean, just that fact makes me interested in it. Yes. Um Apart, apart that, the, the, the idea of, of the difference between uh, pornography and official culture, I, I thought when, the first time I saw Rabbit, I thought very, uh, very fascinating that in a film about, uh, in a movie about, uh, like uh, as ever, uh, about bodies, about uh, something like cancer, something that uh, pop up, the, the 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 star the female star was a porno yeah. star and, and not uh, used yeah. as a porno star but yeah. well here we have to is uh, you have to uh, it's interesting to know that she's a porno star but in fact that wasn't part of my decision to to use her in the film um, it was a really very practical question we needed. We wanted an actress who had some name value, someone that people would write about and who would perhaps draw some people to see her in the film. Uh, but we couldn't afford uh, a well-known actress. So it was really uh, Ivan Reitman who produced that film's uh, idea to use uh, Marilyn Chambers because he had read that she was interested in trying to do a straight movie. So really, it was a very practical question. And when I auditioned her, I wasn't thinking of her at all. In fact, I have never seen her porno films. Um, uh, I really just approached her as an actress to see whether she was right for the role or not. Um, it's so, you know, creatively for me, that wasn't really part of the equation, I must say. Although it, it's a, a it's amusing and it's interesting to connect that now with the films that I've made since then, and I don't mind that. But uh, the fact that she was a porno star really was not part of my choice, you know, to, to have her in the film. Perhaps it's more interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, Genevieve Bourgeois is, is, a, is a choice. Uh, um, <clears throat> oh, you, you, you knew her. Um, I, I, of course, she's a, a Canadian actress, and uh, so she's more, maybe more familiar to me in the, from her early films than for most people, because I remember the, the films that she made when she was uh, living in Canada, you know, small films, uh, Canadian films. 
before she became a, a star, you know, and before she went to live in Malibu, which is where she'd been living for 17 years, I think. Um, but I've always thought she was a wonderful actress, uh, a fantastic voice, uh, uh, a texture, you know. And as she's gotten older, she's gotten even better, you know, more interesting. Um, so, really, this role, I mean, she, I thought, this is, this is for Genevieve, yeah, this is the ch my chance to, to offer her a role in the movie. And I did have to convince her to do it. She was worried, you know, that, I mean, the first scene in the movie, that she's uh, in, a, in the stirrups, you know, and on an examination table in a gynecologist's office and so on. But uh, finally she realized that it would be a good film and that she wanted to be in it. I'm very glad she did. I, I don't know if, if you saw the, the movie, actually, um, Obsession by mm -hmm. Barbara. It's very, it's very strange to find her, and in my memory, after uh, the René film, then after Obsession, to, to have her here in this film was very obsessive, I think. So, so there is a strange connection. What do you think uh, of uh, uh, commercials, television, commercial and commercial, mm -hmm. as a as a cinema genre? Mm -hmm. um, of course, I've never, because I've never directed a commercial, I don't really know what the experience of it is, but I know that there are many famous directors like Martin Scorsese who, and Fellini who, who direct have directed commercials, and many well-known cameramen who really enjoy shooting commercials because, of course, as a technical exercise, it could be very fascinating, very complex, and, and it doesn't take a lot of time, that's the other thing. Um, um, I think there are some very good commercials which are very artful. Um, can you really call them art? I don't know. I mean, maybe in time we will see them as art. I know that a lot of people who do commercials say, yes, the commercial is the art form of the 80s or the 70s or whatever it is. Um, I think the problem is, of course, that they are commercials. They are there to sell something. Um, for me, political films are never really art a certain kind of political film that exists only to sell politics, a brand of politics, Marxist, fascist, whatever. It really is propaganda. It can, there's a sense in which it cannot really be art for me. And so I think in the same way for commercials, they can, they can be fascinating technical exercises, but uh, I don't really think they can be art. This is a very big discussion, of course, because you have to then define what is art, what is not art. Andy Warhol, you know, it's all the all the stuff. Yes, it's yes, a big discussion. Like. But um, but I'm interested to watch commercials. Uh, I sometimes enjoy it, and it's very interesting to see commercials from other countries. You become very used to in America to uh, or Canada to a certain kind of commercial. And then you see some from Japan, it's fantastic to see, you know, or Italy, it's quite different. So, uh, culturally, as something that can be very revealing culturally, that definitely, a commercial is maybe a better thing to look at than a TV series, you know. <laughs> what, what do you think of commercials popping out uh, uh, between uh, one scene and the other of a, of a movie? Some in some way like uh, like like little monsters popping out in your Very previous in your first movies. No uh, commercials in TV. Oh, uh, where, TV. Yes, uh, between one scene yeah. and the other of the movie yeah. you know, by Scorsese, perhaps yeah. or by you. Yeah. Um, I saw Scanner some last year. Yeah. It was a nice score, not in Rai, not in national, uh, not in public television. It was with some shows, some uh, commercials in. It was quite interesting, but yeah, yes, because every time it was, uh, because the film is very concentrated, yes. very hard. Yes. So, 
it, it, it turns it into something else. It becomes a different experience. But then, of course, television is a different experience than cinema anyway. Uh, I tend now to watch films only on pay TV in America. You prefer? You see them uncut and complete. Um, but it's still different because people, it's like reading a book now. You know, you tape a movie and then you watch it. You watch a part, then you stop, yeah. and the next day you watch some more. You have your favorite scene. I think video has really changed, uh, maybe for the better, but has, has altered uh, cinema, you know, because the people know they have access to it. You can own your own film, which is something not too long ago that was impossible, unbelievable, you know, unless you had 35 millimeter projectors, you couldn't do it, and, and a library, fantastic. I think that is very good, to have access, like a book, to, uh, uh, to, to, to film. So in a way, I think that uh, the day of uh, films shown on TV with commercials is, is going to be very short. It will be dead soon. Yes, yeah. Yeah. also is dying also in yeah. Italy, but you have many, many videos. But um, you are worried when you, uh, you, when you know that your movie is going on TV, or also when you, you see the cassette of your movie, who is, who is going in this little or, well, or larger screen, but in a, an electronic screen and not on the big... No, it doesn't bother me. The, what bothers me is to make sure that it looks right. Uh, for Dead Ringers, for the first time, I went to, to, to Detroit to oversee the transferring of the film from negative to video master because we had to retime the whole scene. Every shot is different on video. And uh, uh, it becomes a different film. For my other films, I was very unhappy with the fly and the dead zone on TV because the color was wrong, the darkness, it was too bright. And I, I didn't understand why it happened. Now I know, because some technician who maybe never saw the film in the theater decided, oh, I don't like, this is too dark, make it bright. Um, so, it, but once you've uh, successfully managed to control the way it looks, I think it's uh, a new life, you know, it's a different. And I'm, I, I'm, I want my films to be good on television. I've always uh, composed them, for example, and I've never, sh I don't shoot in widescreen. And one of the reasons I don't is because I know that it will never look right on video. On, on television if you do that. And I know that for better or for worse, more people will see my films on television than will ever see it in the cinema. I think it's probably now true for almost every film. So it's foolish to deny that. You have to accept it. It's the reality now. Uh, so you might as well make sure that your film looks good on video. You can't say, I make my film only for the cinema and I don't care what happens next. If you do that, I think it's a big mistake.